Welcome back to Movies Outpost. Today we'll be diving into the action thriller film franchise John Wick which includes Chapter 1, Chapter 2, Chapter 3, and Chapter 4. Enjoy the recap. The movie kicks off with John Wick crashing his car into a wall. He emerges from the wreckage bloodied and injured. He applies pressure to a wound in his stomach and watches a video of his late wife Helen on the beach before collapsing to the ground. A few days earlier, on a cloudy day, John wakes up and starts remembering his times with Helen. He thinks about a dinner they had together and the sad moment when she fell into his arms. Then we see him at the hospital with Helen kissing her forehead before the doctor leaves. John, his heart broken, is holding his wife's necklace. We then learn that Helen was sick with a disease that ended up taking her life. John jumps into his car and goes to attend the funeral. After some time, everyone has left the grave, but John is the only one left standing. A man watches him from a distance and after the service, an old friend named Marcus approaches him and offers his condolences, checking in on him as a good friend would. The two engage in a brief conversation before Marcus bids him farewell and departs. After the funeral, John goes back home and starts tidying up. He hears the doorbell ring and finds a delivery lady with a package. She gives him the box, which has a little beagle inside. When he opens it, he finds a note from his late wife, Helen. In the note, she says she's accepted her destiny and wants John to find happiness and love again, starting with this puppy. John gets very emotional reading the letter and begins crying. He takes the puppy from the box and sees the collar decorated with flowers, which makes him think that Helen named the dog Daisy. Later, he gently picks up the puppy from his bed and gently places her on the floor. On the following day, John is awakened by the dog climbing onto his bed and follows him everywhere around the house. He pours cornflakes for the dog and himself, and decides to buy proper food for the puppy and takes her cruising in his vintage 1969 Ford Mustang Mach 1. During a pit stop for gas, John is approached by Yosef Tarasov and two other mobsters. Yosef admires John's car and inquires about its price, to which John responds that it's not for sale. Yosef insults him in Russian, saying everything has a price. John then says not this in fluent Russian, enraging Yosef until one of his companions restrains him, leaving John to drive away carefree. Later in the day, John heads to an abandoned construction site and begins driving his car recklessly, drifting to release his frustration. He goes round and round, narrowly avoiding hitting some trucks before eventually stopping. Later on he jumps into bed and sleeps. During the night Daisy needs to go outside to relieve herself so he takes her downstairs. Two shadowy figures then confront him, and a third person hits him over the head with a bat. As John lies on the ground, the men attack Daisy and one of them kills her. They demand John's car keys, and after finding them the man who whacked him takes off his mask, revealing himself to be Yosef. He swears at John and knocks him out cold. After waking up, John finds his lifeless pet and lays beside it. He then proceeds to bury the dog and cleans up the mess in his home as memories of his wife and the brutal attack from the previous night continue to haunt him. Meanwhile, Yosef drives John's Mustang to Aurelio's store, where he demands clean papers and a new number plate for the car. However, Aurelio recognizes the vehicle and demands to know where Yosef got it from. He brags about stealing the car, and Aurelio orders him to leave the shop immediately, but Yosef responds with arrogance, claiming that they own him. Aurelio shuts him up, stating that he works with his father and whacks him. One of the henchmen pulls out a gun, but the other stops him from shooting. Yosef then insults Aurelio and threatens to take his business elsewhere. Later, John stops by the shop and inquires about the car. Aurelio replies that the car was here and that Yosef is Vigo's son. Later on, Vigo calls Aurelio and asks exactly why he struck his son. Aurelio just replies, Because he stole John Wick's car, sir, and uh, killed his dog. In response, Vigo just says, Oh. Vigo seems worried and goes to his penthouse and tells his henchman that he wants to see his son. In the meantime, John enters his basement with a sledgehammer and begins smashing the floor open. It is revealed to be an arsenal of weapons and gold coins. To resolve the issue, Vigo visits Yosef at his residence. Initially, he compliments him on his stylish jacket, but then he punches him in the stomach to tell him that he messed up. Despite his henchman's request to leave, Vigo insists he stays. He then informs Yosef that John Wick, formerly known as Baba Yaga, or the Boogeyman, used to be associated with him until he retired to marry Helen. Vigo recounts an incident where he witnessed John kill three men in a bar using only a pencil. He then reveals that when John decided to retire, he was assigned an impossible task that involved executing several high-profile assassinations within a short period. To everyone's surprise, John somehow accomplished the impossible task, which was instrumental in establishing the Tarasov Empire. Yosef declares that he can handle the situation and complete the task, but Vigo warns him that John will come for him, and he cannot escape his fate. Vigo then attempts to make amends by calling John, but he hangs up, indicating that they are in some big trouble. 
That night, John gets locked and loaded knowing that Vigo has dispatched a squad of assassins to his house. However, they quickly realize their mistake of taking the boogeyman on face to face. John swiftly neutralizes each and every opponent without hesitation or difficulty. He engages in a fierce combat with a few assailants before dealing a fatal blow to one of them. Turns out Vigo sent 12 assassins, but that is no problem at all, as he blasts his way through each one of them. After the combat has finished, a police officer arrives at the front door and knocks. John recognizes the officer by name and asks if there has been a noise complaint. The officer confirms and inquires if John has returned back to the game, alluding to the lifeless body visible behind him. John says he's just cleaning up, and the officer simply walks away. To handle the aftermath and dispose of the deceased, John contacts an underworld cleanup crew. It's apparent that they understand this won't be their last time helping him. Meanwhile, Vigo approaches John's acquaintance Marcus and offers him a lucrative $2 million contract to assassinate John. Vigo also instructs his assistant Avi to advertise the job opening to other interested parties. Marcus gladly accepts the offer. John decides to make his way to the New York Continental Hotel, which exclusively caters to the criminal underworld. All Continental hotels strictly prohibit any assassinations on its premises. Among the familiar faces, John recognizes Perkins and Sharon. He greets his friend and books a room with a currency the assassins use. We are then introduced to the hotel's manager, Winston. When John inquires about Yosef's whereabouts, Winston informs him that Yosef can be found at a nightclub called Red Circle. John immediately makes his way to the club where Yosef and his friends were enjoying themselves. He then bumps into an old acquaintance of his and suggests that the man take the day off, which he gracefully accepts. Inside the club Yosef is hanging out in the bathhouse. Suddenly, John appears on the club's lower level, killing one of Yosef's associates. Upon spotting John, Yosef flees for his life. John begins shooting at the remaining hitmen, and even though he managed to take out all of his targets, Yosef seems to have made a lucky escape. Losef then calls his man Victor, only to hear the Baba Yaga on the other side taunting him. John eventually returns to the Continental Hotel and tells Sharon he needs a medic in his room. As the medic takes care of the injury to his stomach, the doc warns him that he needs to take it easy to avoid tearing his sutures. John, however, doesn't understand the meaning of easy. Later that night, Marcus ascends to the rooftop of a building across the street and sets up his sniper rifle. He spots John who is sleeping, but he also observes someone entering through the mirror and fires a warning shot at John. Perkins then starts shooting at him, but he narrowly dodges her attacks. Turns out Vigo is offering $4 million to break the Continental's rules and kill John. He engages in a struggle with Perkins and eventually puts her in a headlock, proposing that he would show her mercy in exchange for useful intel. Perkins discloses that Vigo keeps most of his riches in a church basement and says the location. He renders her unconscious and immediately leaves her with Harry in exchange for a gold coin. Unbeknownst to Harry, Perkins has dislocated her thumb and is slipping away. She manages to escape and beats him in a fight to which she puts a pillow on his head and shoots through it. John then visits Vigo's hidden stockpile of goodies inside the chapel. He takes out a gun, shoots the priest and proceeds to kill every man that challenges him. He compels the priest to lead him to the vault or die. He is then taken to the vault room and unlocks the gate. John dismisses the ladies in the vault and sets fire to the entire structure, causing Vigo to lose his fortune. He goes outside to camp on top of a building next to the chapel. He spots Vigo and his main crew enter the premises. A firefight then ensues, with John going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Vigo's men. He manages to take out the most of them, until one assailant jumps into an SUV, and as John reloads and takes out one more enemy, he is clobbered and lands on the ground. Vigo takes advantage of this opportunity to apprehend John. Upon waking up, Vigo questions why he is seeking vengeance over a car and a dog. John reveals that Yosef stole the life of his dog, which was a gift from his late wife, and warns Vigo that he can either hand over Yosef or die with him. But Vigo leaves him to his thugs, who begin to kill him. But luckily, Marcus shoots one of the hitmen, giving John an opening to take out the other. John then runs out into the street, and with Vigo's escape vehicle in sight he takes out the driver. He then aims his gun at Vigo, who is then forced to reveal that Yosef is hidden in a Brooklyn safe house. John then decides to leave him be. At the safe house we see Losef inside a room playing video games with one of his mercenaries. The area surrounding him is covered by multiple teams and multiple snipers. As they all check in, we see that John also checks in. He takes the unconscious man's sniper rifle and begins firing at will with deadly precision. Losef takes off and simultaneously his getaway vehicles erupt in flames. He takes off running, but John finally catches up to him and shoots him in the stomach and then in his head without any hesitation. After John's revenge has been satisfied, he thanks Marcus for helping him out. 
but little do they know that Perkins discovers the two of them communicating. She reports her findings to Vigo, and in response, he orders his henchmen to trap Marcus inside his house. The scene then cuts to Vigo calling John and elaborating to him that Marcus was subdued for failing to complete his job. As they attack him and are about to finish him, he puts up a last stand and takes out a few men but is fatally shot by Perkins. Vigo then heads to a helicopter that will transport him out of the city. The plan is for John to come to Marcus's house, where Perkins will ambush him, but she is summoned to a meeting with Winston, the proprietor of the Continental Hotel. They meet up and Winston informs her that she has violated Continental's rules, resulting in the revocation of her membership as well as her life. Upon discovering Marcus's lifeless body, John sets out on a mission to absolutely kill Vigo and everything that he stands for. He punches his car and spots Vigo and his men en route to their helicopter and tries to ram his car into them. Vigo orders Avi to take out John, but John's vehicle collides with one SUV making it swerve and go overboard. As they play bumper carts with each other, John pulls an amazing move which manages to crash Vigo's car into a pole. The Russians then start pouring out of the SUV and shoot at John, but he instinctively uses his car as a shield and battering ram, ending off all of his assailants. Avi personally gets out of the car and tries to do something, but he too gets killed. Vigo then suddenly rams his SUV into John's car, but he manages to escape before the car goes overboard. With both vehicles out of the picture, the two have a proper western standoff and drop their guns. It's time to get dirty, and they both engage in a fierce rain-soaked hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's quite an even match, until Vigo pulls out a knife. But John uses the blade to his advantage, allowing it to hit him which he then uses his stomach to leverage and break Vigo's arm. He then plunges the knife into Vigo's traps. They sit for about one minute as Vigo cannot believe John done all of this for a dog. John then walks off, leaving him to die. The scene then cuts back to the beginning, with John still bleeding out but determined to keep going after seeing the video of Helen. He stops at a dog shelter to tend to his wound, he also ends up adopting a pit bull before heading home. A few weeks later, the fearless John Wick is in the thick of a pursuit, his objective. To retrieve his Ford Mustang from Abram Tarasov, John pursues a motorcycle rider until he's managed to flip the bike and take an invite card that opens the doors for Abram's location. Tarasov, you see, is the sibling of the late Vigo Tarasov. Hearing of John's approach, Abram wastes no time in packing up his operation. There's this one henchman, a bit too sure of himself who trivializes John and boasts that he could take him on all by himself. He queries Abram, wondering if they're seriously putting everything on the line for a mere car. But Abram reminds him, this isn't just any car, it's John Wick's car. This is the man who decimated his nephew, his brother, and many of his henchmen, all because of his car and a puppy. Abram emphasizes that John Wick is a man of focus, dedication, and sheer determination. He reminds them of the time John eradicated three men with nothing but a pencil. In the meantime, John has managed to uncover the location of his beloved Ford Mustang and makes a beeline for Abram's hideout. But on the way he is pursued by Tarasov's men. Unfortunately his car is hit by his attacker, and one more assailant joins the fray and damages his Mustang. He still manages to turn the vehicle on and make an escape but one lonely bike rider chases him and shoots at him. John has to sacrifice one of his doors to stop the rider in his tracks. He continues back to his objective, and he gets a bit jealous of people ramming his car, so he begins playing the same game. But out of nowhere, he is knocked out of his vehicle and is forced to get into hand-to-hand -hand combat. But as is expected, he takes care of his attackers without much difficulty. He finally makes his way to Abram's room, and the man is scared for his life. Interestingly, John spares Abram's life on the condition that he vows to never cross paths with him again. Accepting this truce, John retreats and returns to his abode, his mission accomplished. Soon after, John finds himself returning all mementos of his past life as a hitman to their resting place in the ground. His goal, to embrace the simple, ordinary existence of a man mourning the loss of his wife. A few days later, Aurelio pays John a visit at his request to fix his battered Ford Mustang. After assessing the damage, Aurelia warns that it'll take some time to restore the car to its former glory. As dusk falls, John gets an unexpected visit from Santino D'Antonio, a notorious figure in the criminal underworld. Santino reminds John of their shared history of how he aided him in completing an impossible task, which enabled him to retire and marry Helen. In return for that help, John had made a sacred promise known as a marker, symbolized by a medallion marked with his own blood. Now Santino has come to call in that debt. Despite all these compelling reasons, John says he's out of the game and retired. Santino doesn't take this rejection lightly. In response, he launches a devastating assault on John's home, wielding a grenade launcher and setting the house ablaze. Against all odds, John and his dog manage to survive the brutal attack to their house. 
John just stands there staring at all his lost memories as they burn away. Left without a home, John, accompanied by his loyal canine companion, seeks refuge at the Continental Hotel in New York City. In his desperate situation, he looks to Winston for guidance. Winston, however, issues a stark reminder. To refuse the marker would mean breaking two sacred rules of their underworld, no killing on Continental grounds, and the obligation to honor every marker. The D'Antonio family is infamous for their ruthless ways, mainly because Santino's father holds as a part of the high table, a council composed of twelve powerful crime lords who control all the Continental hotels worldwide. Faced with this harsh reality, John has no option but to reluctantly fulfill his commitment. He goes to meet with Santino, who cuts to the chase immediately. He tasks John with killing his sister, Gianna. You see Santino craves his sister's upcoming seat at the high table, a seat their father deems her more deserving of. John, bound by his commitment, accepts the mission. John heads to his storage unit to gather some essential belongings before jetting off to Rome. He checks into the Roman branch of the Continental Hotel, where Julius, the manager, welcomes him warmly. When Julius jokingly asks if he's in town to target the Pope, John reassures him that's not the case, and is granted access to the hotel's facilities. Next, John drops by a unique tailor shop that serves solely to assassins, crafting bulletproof garments to aid their dangerous work in the criminal underworld. After that, it's time to get his weapons. The shopkeeper, already familiar with the legend of John Wick, knows precisely what type of weaponry John would need to successfully complete his mission. However, before John can proceed, he needs to find out where Gianna is. So, he visits a contact who provides him with a blueprint of her location, which would help him navigate the various entrances and exits. As night falls, John, now fully geared up, prepares for the battle that lies ahead. He infiltrates the celebration for Gianna's ascension to her seat at the high table and confronts her in a dressing room. Faced with the inevitability of her demise, Gianna chooses to meet her end on her own terms. As Gianna takes her last breath, John ensures his mission's success by shooting her in the head, thus fulfilling the marker. With his mission accomplished, John attempts to make his exit. However, Cassian, Gianna's bodyguard, spots him and recognizes him instantly. Cassian quickly deduces that John must have been sent to eliminate Gianna. In the blink of an eye, a full-blown shootout erupts. John immediately springs into action, dashing through a lively concert while exchanging fire with his attackers. As he breaks away from the concert chaos, he finds himself up against more adversaries. Undeterred, he takes down approximately six men before swiftly changing his course to navigate through the city's subterranean catacombs. In the twisting tunnels, he comes across Ares, Santino's loyal bodyguard. But a surprising turn of events awaits him, a double crossing. An ambush takes place, but John manages to shield himself using his armored outfit, knocking off a few assailants in the process. He cleverly uses the labyrinthine catacombs to his advantage, isolating his enemies to deal with them one-on-one -on -one or in smaller clusters. In the ensuing carnage, John's remarkable skills and deadly precision comes to play. Every target he zeroes in on meets a swift end. In a breathtaking display of ferocity and efficiency, he goes on a furious killing spree with a kill count of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 men within a time span of roughly 45 seconds. John narrowly escapes the catacombs, only to be struck by a car out on the street. Emerging from the vehicle is Cassian, who opens fire on John. The two then engage in a high-stakes hand-to-hand combat. The fight is a fierce display of might and skill as both men trade blows, each gaining and losing the upper hand. Their fierce combat comes to an abrupt halt as they crash into the lobby of the Continental Hotel. Adhering to the hotel's non-negotiable rule, no killing on the premises, John and Cassian cease their fight. In an unexpected twist, the two adversaries find themselves in the bar. John reveals the motive behind his assassination, but even after learning that Santino was the orchestrator, Cassian vows to kill John, promising him a swift end. When John returns to his room, he receives a call from Santino, Santino acknowledges that John might feel personally wronged and says he understands if John is upset. In a twist of irony, Santino places a bounty of seven million on John Wick's head. Disguising his move as an act of revenge for his sister, as the sun rises on a new day, John gets ready to check out of the Continental Hotel in Rome, preparing for his return journey to New York City. The hefty contract instantly grabs the attention of high-profile assassins worldwide. Meanwhile, Santino meets with Winston, who asks for a blood oath to confirm that John has fulfilled his commitment and is no longer under any obligation to Santino. It's here that Santino dismissively tells him there's no need for that, assuming that John won't survive his return to New York. Winston, however, cautions Santino that he's made a grave mistake, warning him about the price of betraying someone like John Wick, a man not to be trifled with. Winston states that Santino has in essence stabbed the devil in the back, forcing John back into a life he had chosen to leave behind. 
Meanwhile, John returns to New York City, where he is greeted not with open arms but with a hail of bullets from assassins eager to claim the $7 million prize. As he traverses the city, John, a renowned assassin himself, faces relentless attacks, turning his return home into a deadly game of survival. Killing John Wick, as these hopeful assassins soon discover, is no easy feat. His journey through the subway system continues with a confrontation by Cassian. They engage in a silent gunfight amidst the oblivious crowd, using silencers to avoid creating panic. The confrontation escalates into a brutal fistfight, ending with John stabbing Cassian in the aorta, leaving his fate hanging in the balance. This battle leaves John seriously injured and seeking help. Spotting a beggar, he offers a gold coin for assistance. With the beggar's help, he manages to extract himself from the dangerous situation. With his wounds still aching, John seeks the assistance of an underground crime boss known as the Bowery King. In this underworld hideaway, John's injuries are being tended to, providing some relief. But he is in need of more than just medical aid. He asks the Bowery King to leverage his extensive underground network to pinpoint Santino's location. He also requests weapons to assist him in his mission. The Bowery King, however, is curious. He questions why he should aid John. In response, John points out the dire consequences that would follow if Santino secured a seat at the high table. The Bowery King would lose his power, his resources would dwindle, and he would lose control over his underground networks. The thought of John Wick taking on a member of the high table excites his interest. After considering John's points, the Bowery King decides to help. Somebody, please, get this man a gun. He hands John a gun equipped with only seven bullets, one for each million of the bounty, and directs him to an art museum where Santino is hosting a gala. Armed and determined, John infiltrates the gala at the museum. The dance floor parts like a sea as the crowd recognizes John and fearfully retreats. Drawing his pistol, John makes quick work of seven of Santino's men, one bullet for each. However, he's quickly out of ammunition and is forced to procure a weapon from one of his downed adversaries. John relentlessly pursues Santino, mowing down any of his henchmen who dare to stand in his way. However, the chase takes him into a mirror maze, a disorienting room that seems to defy the laws of space and direction. John struggles to find his way through and close in on Santino. To make matters worse, Santino's security enforcer, Ares, arrives with a crew of guards, adding to the difficulty. But even this doesn't slow John down. He expertly begins dispatching Santino's security team one at a time. As he finally downs the last henchman, he clears a path for himself. Eventually, John comes face to face with Ares. They engage in a fierce close-range combat, pushing each other to the limit. The battle is brutal, but John ultimately emerges victorious, leaving Ares defeated and lifeless. However, during the chaos, Santino manages to slip away. Turns out he's hiding inside the Continental Hotel. John arrives at the Continental shortly after and asks Sharon for Santino's whereabouts. Sharon directs him to the hotel lounge. Upon reaching the lounge, Winston, the hotel owner, urgently warns John against taking any rash actions within the Continental's boundaries, as breaking the unbreakable rule of no killing would lead to severe consequences. However, John has had enough. His life had been torn apart due to Santino's manipulations, his house destroyed, forced back into a life of violence he thought he had left behind. Ignoring Winston's warnings, John in one swift move, kills Santino right in the lounge room, throwing the underworld into chaos. With the weight of Santino's death on his shoulders, John hastily departs from the Continental. He retreats to his old house, finding solace in the memory of his late wife. He relives the beautiful moments they shared in their home, a difference to the brutality of his current life. The following day, Sharon escorts John to meet Winston in a park. It's here that John learns the severity of his actions, violating the rules of the Continental by murdering Santino on its grounds. According to the High Table's decree, the bounty on John's life is now doubled and extended globally. As a consequence, Winston pronounces John excommunicado, revoking all his rights and access to the resources of the underworld. But Winston provides John a one-hour head start before his excommunicado status becomes effective, a small gesture of professional courtesy. He also gives John a marker, a token of a debt that can be redeemed for future aid. Simultaneously, everyone stops in the park and stares at him. They go about their business, and John tells Winston he vows to kill whoever comes his way. Winston acknowledges this with saying, Of course you will. As John departs the park with his dog, Winston enacts John's excommunicado. The one-hour countdown begins. In the very park where their conversation took place, phones begin to ring, signifying the impending hunt. Determined and relentless, John begins to run as the film draws to a suspenseful close, leaving his fate up in the air. John dashes through the bustling streets of New York City, counting down the minutes until his grace period is officially over. 
he runs into an alley and sees the TikTok man, one of the Bowery King's spies. With time running against him, he hops into a taxi only to be met with gridlocked roads. With a mere 20 minutes left on the clock, John opts to continue his journey on foot. Before he leaves the taxi he hands the driver a gold coin, entrusting him with the safe delivery of his dog to the Continental. He makes his way to a library, and upon arrival, requests a specific book. Hidden within its pages, he uncovers a secret compartment containing valuable items, coins, a marker, and a photo of him and his late wife, which he kisses. His solitude is disrupted by the looming presence of a large man named Ernest, despite John's insistence that his grace period isn't over. Ernest is undeterred by the minor discrepancy in timing. A fierce brawl ensues in the quiet library, ultimately leading to John using the book to brutally break Ernest's jaw and finish him off. However, the victory doesn't come without its toll. John is left with a stab wound on his shoulder. With the clock ticking down to just five minutes left, he makes an urgent visit to the doctor at his home. The doctor begrudgingly assists him, only to stop abruptly as the grace period expires. John's $14 million bounty is now active, and the world's deadliest assassins are set to hunt him down. He is forced to complete the stitching of his wound himself, swallowing some pills to ease the pain. The doctor requests John to shoot him, as a way to convince the high table that he obeyed the excommunicado order. He obliges, leaving the doctor wounded but alive, before departing to face the chaos that awaits him. John doesn't get a moment's rest before he is set upon by an onslaught of assassins, eager to claim the bounty on his head. Cornered in an antique arms shop, he resourcefully uses the collection of historic weapons to defend himself in a brutal battle involving a deadly array of antique knives. Victorious but battered, he steps out into the city streets, only to find himself pursued by yet more assassins. He leads them into a nearby stable, where he cunningly uses the horses and their lethal kicks to eliminate several of his assailants. John escapes the stable atop one of the horses, but his freedom is short-lived as two motorcyclists join the chase. In an impressive display of agility and precision, he dispatches them both while still on horseback. In response to his relentless survival, the bounty on John's head is increased to $15 million. John seeks refuge at a theater, where he is frisked and disarmed before meeting with the director. He pleads for her help, offering the cross he had retrieved from the library as a token of their shared history. She leads him backstage and agrees to grant him passage to Casablanca. To solidify their agreement and sever their ties, she brands him with the symbol of the cross. Simultaneously, a woman of mystery makes her way into the Continental. After handing a coin to Sharon, Winston is informed of the arrival of an adjudicator. Upon inspecting Santino's body, she informs Winston that he must relinquish his position for failing to enforce the strict, no-bloodshed rule of the Continental against John. The adjudicator then pays a visit to the Bowery King. Despite his claims of respecting John's excommunicado status, she informs him that the high table's reach is inescapable. She orders him to abandon his position and leave town due to his decision to provide John with the gun used to kill Santino. Unfazed by her demands, the Bowery King defiantly declares that he cannot be dethroned because he himself is the throne. John eventually makes his arrival in Casablanca. Unfortunately for him, he is immediately met with hostility as he is attacked by three knife-wielding assassins. In the ensuing fight, John kills one, but the confrontation is interrupted by another man who declares that the hotel manager has granted John amnesty. Not pleased with the development, one of the assailants attempts to strike John, but he is promptly shot by the newcomer. The man escorts John to the Casablanca branch of the Continental Hotel. Inside, he notices photographs of a woman and her daughter. Suddenly, two aggressive dogs take up positions beside him. From the shadows, the hotel manager, Sophia, emerges and shoots him. His bulletproof suit saves him, and Sophia admits that she should kill him. However, he presents her with a marker, a life debt that she owes him for rescuing her daughter years ago. Sophia pleads with John not to invoke the marker, but he is unyielding. He insists that she must lead him to her former boss. With visible reluctance, Sophia agrees to honor the marker and help John. Elsewhere, the adjudicator arrives at a small sushi shop to meet a man named Zero. Recognizing the high table's coin, Zero quickly understands the reason for her visit. He already knows about John's situation and expresses interest in hunting him down. The adjudicator tasks him with this mission, as well as dealing with those who aided John. Back at the theater, the director observes her student's ballet performance, oblivious to the slaughter of her guards by efficient and ruthless ninjas. The tranquility of the ballet is disrupted as three men invade the stage, followed by the adjudicator and Zero. The adjudicator condemns the director's assistance to John, in violation of her pact with the high table. Agreeing to demonstrate her loyalty, the director is informed that her penance must be given in blood. 
Zero promptly runs his blade through both her hands, leaving her in agony but alive. Meanwhile, Sophia prepares for a confrontation, equipping herself and her dogs with weaponry. Despite John's assurance that he only wants to negotiate with her former boss, she remains doubtful. They make their way to a complex and meet with Berata, Sophia's old boss. John asks Berata for guidance to the Elder, the one who resides above the high table, in hopes of making amends for his actions. Berata explains that the Elder cannot be found unless he wishes to be found. He suggests John should travel into the desert, follow the stars until he is on the brink of death, and only then might the Elder reveal himself. However, before John and Sophia can depart, Berata demands a tribute, one of Sophia's dogs. She refuses, and in a cruel twist, Berata shoots one of her dogs. He hadn't anticipated the dog's bulletproof vest though, saving it from his shot. Sophia responds by shooting Berata, and initiating a battle with his guards. One of Sophia's dogs leaps into action engaging with the enemies. After the guards are eliminated, Sophia delivers another shot to Berata's leg. The pair, accompanied by Sophia's dogs, make a swift exit, gunning down additional guards as they navigate their way out of the complex, their destination, the desert. Deep in the heart of the desert, John and Sophia stop, with a prick of his finger, John signs the marker, thus fulfilling Sophia's debt to him. Prioritizing her dogs, Sophia gives them most of the remaining water, swilling the last dregs in her mouth before returning it to the bottle. Forewarning John that his death is inevitable, be it here or further down the line, she watches as he heads off into the endless dunes with the almost empty bottle. He alone endures the blistering sun and chilling night, traversing the unforgiving dunes. His strength dwindles with each passing moment, until finally his body gives in, and he collapses onto the sand, exhausted and dehydrated. Back in New York City, within the fortress-like stronghold of the Bowery King, a squad of deadly ninjas executes the King's guards with ruthless efficiency. Zero and the Adjudicator make their way to the roof where they find the Bowery King. He proclaims his willingness to show fealty to the high table, but the adjudicator says that his opportunity has long passed. The Bowery King sends away a lone pigeon to safety, just before Zero punishes him with seven precise cuts, one for each of the bullets he had gifted to John Wick. In the desert, a figure shrouded in a cloak stumbles upon the unconscious John Wick. Awakening in a luxuriously appointed tent, John comes face to face with the Elder, a man who has never encountered a soul as lost as John's. When questioned why he seeks life, John replies it is to remember his beloved wife, Helen. The Elder presents a choice, he can either perish in the desert, or reclaim his title as the Boogeyman. John will never be able to leave the underworld, but he can reverse the excommunicado by pledging to kill Winston. John agrees to this bargain, pledging fealty by severing his wedding ring finger and offering the ring to the Elder. Accepting this gesture of loyalty, the Elder directs his staff to outfit John with a new wardrobe, and prepare him for his journey back to New York City. As John arrives in New York, he's confronted by two assassins. However, before they can act, a group of ninjas cut them down. The ninjas bring John before Zero. A tense standoff ensues between them both, but it is interrupted by a line of schoolchildren passing through. John uses this to escape, killing two motorcycle-bound ninjas and procuring a bike for himself. Zero and his team give chase as John speeds away on the freeway. Despite their relentless pursuit and sword attacks, John manages to neutralize several of his assailants while maintaining high speed. The chase carries on into the city where John and Zero eventually crash near the Continental Hotel. Given the sacred rules of the Continental, Zero can't kill John, who has managed to touch the hotel grounds. At the Continental, Sharon escorts John to a waiting room where Zero follows, eagerly expressing his admiration for him. He insists they're both alike, but John doesn't see it that way. He is briefly reunited with his dog, instructing it to sit and stay before being taken to see Winston. He is taken in a special glass room, utilized when one needs to see if their adversary is hiding weapons. Winston knows John has been sent to kill him, and admits that he'd prefer to be killed by a friend. But he presents John with an alternative. He could follow through with his orders, and eternally be the feared boogeyman, or he could choose to defy the high table, and die as the man his beloved wife knew and cherished. The adjudicator arrives to discuss Winston's decision to step down. Unyielding, Winston refuses to abdicate his position. She inquires if John intends to carry out his mission to kill Winston, he too declines. With these refusals, the adjudicator announces the deconsecration of the Continental. Business, including violence, is now permissible on its premises. Winston and John are now open targets, and a squad of the High Table's finest enforcers are en route. Anticipating the impending chaos, Winston reinstates all of John's privileges, noting the necessity for a substantial arsenal. In the armory, John is briefed about the High Table's improved armor, 
prompting the armorer to recommend a more potent caliber of ammunition. As the battle nears, Winston takes refuge in the armory safe, leaving John, Sharon, and a few dedicated men to hold off the High Table's impending onslaught. The High Table's forces are heavily armored, forcing John to engage them at close quarters. Meanwhile, the adjudicator contacts Winston, questioning the longevity of his defense. Disinterested in her taunts, Winston ends the call prematurely. The initial wave of High Table enforcers kill all the staff, leaving only John and Sharon standing. John tries his best to do what he can with the limited impact his bullets are doing. He gets up close and personal, and after firing underneath their helmets, he manages to take out a decent number of assailants. Both he and Sharon then regroup in the armory. Sharon equips John with an armor-piercing shotgun capable of breaching the enemy's formidable defenses. When the second wave of attackers descend upon the Continental, John and Sharon both expertly dispatch them, their new shotguns ripping through the high table's improved armor with ease. After a bit more killing using his pistol, John finds himself at gunpoint by a mercenary, but he's saved by none other than Zero. He begins to chase him throughout the building and gets caught up in a ferocious duel in the glass room, grappling with two nimble ninjas, their fight causing a cascade of shattered glass. Ultimately, John manages to defeat them using their own sword, continuing his ascent up the stairs where Zero taunts him through a glass barrier. However, John is suddenly ambushed by Zero's elite henchmen, the Shinobi, who toy with him, savoring the honor of fighting him. With John momentarily incapacitated, the Shinobi joke around and even help him back up. They laugh at how slow he's gotten, and about his laziness due to his recent retirement. Shaking off the fatigue, John weaponizes his belt, launching into a grueling third round of combat. As the fight drags on, a weary John employs unorthodox methods, such as groin kicks and ear slaps, eventually culminating in a powerful slam that shatters the glass floor beneath them. Despite their best efforts, the shinobi are unable to recover, but John manages to rise, leaving them behind in search of Zero. He manages to find him upstairs where the two immediately engage in an intense sword duel. The fight goes back and forth for quite some time, but John, using Zero's own disappearing trick, gains the upper hand, mortally wounding him with a swift sword strike through his chest. Exhausted and injured, both men sit together. As he's bleeding out, Zero talks about the thrill of the fight, assuring John that he will catch up. With a dismissive reply, John leaves him behind, and Zero succumbs to his injuries, collapsing dead. Following this display of resistance, the adjudicator contacts Winston again, suggesting a parlay might be in both parties' best interests. Winston agrees. They meet on the roof and discuss negotiations. The adjudicator warns that this was just the beginning, and that the Continental Hotel will inevitably fall. Winston, however, remains unfazed, boldly asserting his deep-seated ties to the city and his capacity to reclaim the Continental, declaring himself as New York personified. John makes his way to the rooftop where the adjudicator, in an unexpected turn of event, interprets Winston's display of force as a demonstration of his loyalty to the high table. She reinstates the Continental and his position as its manager, but she also insists that something must be done about John Wick. Winston takes action by shooting John multiple times. The force propels him backwards until he plummets off the roof, tumbling down multiple structures that somewhat cushion his fall. The adjudicator, appeased by this turn of events, makes her exit. However, her satisfaction is short-lived as upon re-entering the Continental, she is informed that John's body has mysteriously vanished. Winston, equally alarmed, agrees that they cannot afford to have a vengeful John Wick seeking retribution. Quietly, he utters the phrase, Baba Yaga, acknowledging the legendary reputation of their new adversary. In an alleyway, the TikTok man maneuvers a cart with John's battered body. He is then dumped in front of a makeshift throne, occupying the severely wounded Bowery King. He addresses the barely conscious John, speaking of the betrayal and the stupid rules of the high table. Filled with a burning rage, the Bowery King reveals his desire for revenge. He poses the question to John who manages to lift his head and musters the strength to say one word. Yeah. Chapter 4 begins with John Wick training. The Bowery King enters the scene and presents a new suit for John and asks him if he is ready. He replies with, Yeah. The scene cuts to the desert where John is chasing three horsemen. They run for their lives as he sprays them, connecting with the first one. As he continues his pursuit, the elder watches from a distance. John then takes down the second horse rider and finally the last one as well. He stops and gets off his horse while reloading as he walks towards the elder. He asks to what he owes this pleasure, and John wants his ring and his freedom back. He says he no longer has the ring and tells John the only peace he will have is in death. John doesn't like that answer and puts two bullets into him. Going back to the New York Continental Hotel, a man known as the Harbinger enters and hands an envelope to Sharon, insisting on speaking with the manager. 
Sharon contacts Winston, alerting him of the situation and allowing the man to ascend to the upper floors. The Harbinger then reveals that the hotel has been condemned and provides an hourglass, giving him one hour to evacuate. He also says that the twelve members of the High Table have signed a decree granting Marquis the power to act as judge, jury, and executioner. Winston and Sharon instantly make their way to have a meeting with Marquis. They enter the room and see an hourglass as Marquis says an amazing quote. Second chances are the refuge of men who fail. Winston says that he shot John Wick, and Marquis laughs saying that he's still alive and polluting everything he touches. He goes on to say that the Continental is being expelled from the filthy city of New York, and Sharon stresses the importance of everyone following the rules, even the high table. Marquis blames Winston for Wick's actions, and as the last grains of sand fall, the Continental Hotel explodes. Winston is then declared excommunicado, and Marquis aims a gun at him, but shoots Sharon instead. On the floor, Sharon breathes his last breaths and says, It has been an honor, my friend. The scene then cuts to introduce Kane, a blind man in Paris. He overhears a young girl playing music in a small crowd. Shortly after, he is summoned to a meeting with Marquis who wastes no time in getting to the point. Kane almost breached the terms of his deal by getting too close to his daughter that day. Despite his retirement, Marquis threatens to take Kane's daughter's life if he doesn't comply with their demand that he takes a life. Kane is given a card with the word Wick on it which stops him in his tracks. He reveals that he was a friend of John's but is willing to provide his services to the high table. We make our way to Japan. At the Continental Hotel a tracker makes his way to the reception desk. We meet Akira, who allows the dog entry as an emotional support animal. She then walks with the manager Shimazu, who is also her father. She tells him that everyone is on edge as he has a relationship with John Wick that this could result in an unforeseeable future with the high table. Shimazu tells her not to worry, as they have done nothing wrong. He leaves her and makes his way upstairs where he is met by John. He tells him that killing the elder was a mistake. He informs him of Sharon's death and John is not pleased. He tells him that the high table will not stop, and John refers to Shimazu as a dear friend. Downstairs the tracker looks at John Wick in his book and quickly realizes the concierge from the high table are in the hotel. They go to Akira and ask for the manager. Akira tells them to get comfortable, as she rushes upstairs to her father and sees John Wick there. Shimazu says to stay with John, as he handles the men downstairs. As he is on his way, he tells his men to get locked and loaded. They all go to arm themselves and are ready for war if necessary. He goes downstairs and greets them. They believe the hotel is providing help to John Wick. They demand full hotel access, and he agrees on the condition they hand their guns over, as no business can be conducted on continental grounds. Kane then makes his way onto the scene and greets Shimazu. They talk about their friendship, and the concierge silences them saying the hotel is deconsecrated and to move. The lights go off and come back on very lightly, as archers surround them. They fire and kill a few men as swords are taken out. They get into a fierce combat but the hotel wins and aim their guns at the last man standing. Simultaneously, a hit squad wearing complete bulletproof armor enter the building. They are commanded to find John Wick as the men retreat. On the rooftop, Akira and John are attacked. Akira makes marksman shots killing some men. John knows the weak spot of the armor, which is located in the neck, allowing him to expertly take out multiple men at once. The remaining troops kill anyone in sight at the hotel. Kane gets involved in the action and for a blind man he beats the living hell out of his assailants. Akira and John attempt to escape the building and begin killing anyone in their sights. Akira is a bloody good fighter as she kills and massacres all the men that come her way. John takes out a few but Akira is then shot. Her father comes to the rescue and kills the shooters. He picks his daughter up and tells John to go the way he came in. As he makes his way out he is met by four assailants. He easily takes out two as he goes into combat with the remaining. After using a million bullets on their armor he kills them and picks up a rifle. He is then ambushed by an NBA-sized player and John decides that he's into nunchucks. He takes on two of them but ends up pulling his pistols out killing them. He runs into more enemies but the automatic takes care of them easily. He gets bored and goes back to his nunchucks. He does some sick-ass moves as he swings and kills the man. He has a two-second breather as Kane makes his way in. Him and Kane have a fight, they just pull the trigger at each other. But Kane manages to get the upper hand, and then the tracker begins firing. He shoots at Kane, and this lets John escape. The bounty for John has now been raised to $20 million. Damn that's a lot of money. As he goes outside he kills another man and takes his medallion. A dog then comes from nowhere and kills two attackers. The tracker shows himself and John is confused. The tracker then kills an assailant from behind him and tells John he wants more money and lets him be. Elsewhere, Akira and her father are trying to escape but are found by Kane. He tells them to give John's whereabouts and leave, but Shimazu decides to protect John and takes out his sword. They begin fighting. 
Kane easily gets the upper hand in the fight and stabs Shimazu. Akira runs to her dying father and Kane has mercy on her and lets her escape. Later on John finds himself in the train station and finds Akira there as well. She blames him for all this chaos and tells him he must kill Kane or she will. Back in New York, Winston is speaking to the Bowery King and tells him he needs to speak to John. He tells him that didn't turn out well last time. We then cut to a scene where the tracker is having a meeting with Marquis. He informs him that he will find and kill John for 25 million. They negotiate, and after Marquis stabs his hand, they shake on 23 million. Later on, John and Winston meet at Sharon's memorial. Winston tells John that he will run out of bullets before they run out of heads. Instead, he should challenge Marquis to one-on-one -on -one combat. The members at the high table can do so, and if the challenge is presented, they must accept. Winston tells John to go and amend things with his family who already have a place on the high table. John makes his way to Berlin and goes inside a church. As he walks towards the altar, the priest pulls out a shoddy and shoots at John. He tells him nice suit, as the scene switches to Marquis talking on the phone with the tracker. He informs him that John is in Berlin, and Marquis says either John dies or him. Back inside the church, John's family torture him as they tell him that he ruined everything. They intend to kill him, until he mentions the one-on-one -on -one duel. They tell John that if they kill the man who murdered their father, they will mend his ticket and he can come back to the family. He says he needs a way in and they send Claus to help him. They make their way to a kingpin who laughs as Kane walks in. John has been set up by his family who gave him up to save themselves. Kane and the kingpin aim their guns at each other when the tracker arrives as another guest. He takes a seat as well. All three men want to be the one to kill John, and so they play a game of cards to decide. And as the dealer somehow draws a five of a kind, John slices him, and everyone starts attacking each other. Shots are fired, and John makes his way inside the club where he begins to dismantle every man coming his way. He finds the kingpin and chases him until he throws him off the stairs, killing him. He takes his tooth out as evidence and makes his way back to the church where his family accept him back and do an initiation for him. Winston walks into a room where Marquis is surprised to see him. He hands him the dual notice. The terms for John's victory is his freedom, as well as Winston title and rebuilt hotel at the high table's expense. Marquis tells him that Winston is the second, and hence he either walks away a champion or in the grave. John is immediately taken to a table where he sits opposite Marquis. They flip cards to decide the location, time and weapon of the duel. The duel will be at sunrise with pistols, but Marquis substitutes himself for Kane. As John leaves, Kane says he won't fight. Marquis tells him that if he wins, he and his daughter are freed. John makes his way back to the church and meets Kane there. They have a friendly chat over their loved ones. Kane tells John that he is a dear friend, but if it is between him and his daughter, it has to be him. Later, John heads down to an abandoned station where he meets the Bowery King. He hands him a suit and tells him he must look his best if he's getting married or buried. Elsewhere, Marquis goes to his main man and tells him that Wick will never make it to the duel. His man understands and goes in search for him. The contract for Wick has now changed to seek and destroy and has been scaled to a massive $26 million. On the radio, everyone crook in the city is alerted to kill John Wick as he is a thorn in their paradise. Many different crews get locked and loaded as they prepare to destroy the city to find Mr. Wick. In the station, John tells the Bowery King he needs a gun. He gives a pistol that has a 21 mag capacity and about 50 other technical benefits of the gun. John is impressed and says he needs to get as close to the church as he can. They take him on a boat ride and say that's as far as they can go. John exits and the radio station is immediately alerted to his location. He then sees many men come from all directions. The fighting begins and as he takes out the first two, he is hit by a car. He takes out the driver and is rammed once again. He deals with them and likes the idea of ramming people. He uses the car as cover while killing a few more and takes off. His location is updated on the radio, and an army of mercenaries make their way towards him. He puts the car in reverse and kills the driver of one of them, and decides to do a donut as he takes care of the men in the middle. His vehicle is then rammed and flipped over. John gets ready for war and expertly takes out four men. The fifth engages him in close combat but was quickly subdued as well. The right hand of Marquis runs after John as they shoot in between cars coming their way. They go into a fist fight and he throws John onto oncoming traffic. They continue fighting until he himself is thrown onto a vehicle. John picks up his gun and goes running. It becomes chaotic as bullets are fired at will and people get hit by cars. John tries to get off the road until he is shot at. He makes his way back into the traffic as the tracker arrives on the scene. He gets strapped and is just running around killing anything that moves. The tracker starts firing at John as he gets away and jumps on a bike. They chase him and corner him as he does a sick-ass move. 
he makes his way inside a building where he can give himself the advantage, he begins eliminating his attackers one by one, until he has pretty much screwed everyone up. The tracker then gets a call from Marquis, and the tracker says $35 million for John Wick, and ends the phone. He starts killing his rivals so that he can claim the prize for himself. Marquis calls him back and the tracker wants $40 million now. Marquis agrees, and everyone is alerted to the prize money increase. John stays in the building and kills off two assailants as he uses a custom-made rifle. In the next 10 seconds he takes out like 10 goons. The tracker is also shooting at will, until they start fighting each other. They get into a fist fight, and John gets him at gunpoint, as Marky right-hand man is aiming his gun at the tracker's dog. Instead of saving himself, John saved the dog, and the tracker immediately realizes that John is one honorable man. John runs out of the building and looks at his watch. It is near sundown, but his location is announced once again. He has a good stare down with his attackers until he starts spamming his trigger. Like a game with levels, he has to take out a few men every flight of stairs he climbs. He kills and kills and kills some more until he reaches the top. He is then thrown down the first flight of stairs until he is beaten and kicked down to the bottom of all the stairs. There is three minutes to go, and as he gives up, Kane gets there and tells him to start climbing. He helps him up and they start fighting their way to the top. Kane and John are one deadly combo, as they easily take out many assailants making their way to the top. Marquise's right-hand man is once again fighting with John, but this time he has had enough and gets him onto the ground. He walks towards him with his pistol, and as John is about to die the tracker is there and looks at his dog, he decides to save John's life. Kane makes his way down and stabs the man's hand with a pencil subduing him. As Kane and John walk off the tracker looks at the man that hurt his puppy. He kills him and his dog pees on his head for payback. John just makes it in time for sunrise, as the tracker takes a seat to enjoy the show. The two men take off their vests, they are handed a pistol each and are ordered to take their positions. Kane tells him see you in the next life, they take 30 paces away from each other and are handed a bullet, Kane tells Marky to shut up. Winston and John enjoy the sunrise, John asks for Winston's last words and he tells him to have fun out there. The Harbinger asks if both men are ready when they agree, he says fire. Fire! Kane is hit in the shoulder and that's it. They come closer to each other and reload their pistols. He says fire again. Fire! John cops one in the shoulder and Kane gets it in the stomach area. They are commanded to step closer. They reload once again and some sad music is being played knowing that one must die. Everyone just stops and stares at each other, awaiting the call. Fire is shouted again. Fire! John is on the ground bleeding out as Winston looks at him in concern. The tracker gets emotional as well. Marky grabs the last bullet and walks to Kane to take his gun. Kane asks if his daughter is free and he says yes. He loads the bullet in the gun and walks up to John and aims it at him. Winston interjects and calls him arrogant and says John didn't shoot. He looks at him, but John pulls the trigger and gets a headshot. The tracker laughs and the harbinger tells John his obligation is satisfied and he is freed. He tells Kane him and his daughter are also free. He tells Winston that he will be reinstated, and the hotel will be rebuilt. Their business is concluded, and they walk off. Kane goes to John and calls him brother, and John says that Kane owes him one, insinuating that he intentionally didn't kill him. Winston and John speak, and John tells him will you take me home. Winston looks at his wound and says of course. Winston's eyes become watery as John sits alone on the stairs. He thinks of Helen and whispers that word. He slowly collapses on the ground. Not gonna lie, this almost had me in tears. Back at home we are at a graveyard with John and Helen's graves side by side. The Bowery King, Winston and John's dog stand there. Winston is shattered and puts his hand on the tombstone and says goodbye my son. They walk off and sadly, the movie comes to an end. We have a post credit scene which is just as sad. Kane has a bouquet of flowers and is finally walking towards his daughter. With a smile on his face, we move to find Akira walking towards him and pulls a knife out as the movie cuts to black. Thanks for watching. I'm trying to get to 100,000 subscribers and your support is greatly appreciated. Until the next one.